the simplest solution and the one that lots and lots of young people use is a target date fund. Uh, if you invest in a target date fund, the back testing says that your the the median, like uh, half half of the scenarios are better and half of the scenarios are worse. But the median outcome is that you'll have about twice your lifetime spending power if you save 10% for 40 years working and then are retired for 30 years. But I really encourage young people to take advantage of the Roth now only because we have no idea what tax rates are going to be 40 or 50 years from now. And it is a way of protecting against the risk of higher taxes later. Now, Paul, my first, my first question is not necessarily so much on the technical investing side. We'll get into all of that later in the conversation. But I'm curious how the idea for a nonprofit foundation devoted to investor education came about. Why did you decide this route and how'd you get there? Well, it was uh, 30 plus years in the coming because uh, in building our investment advisory firm that we started in 1983, we built it by giving free public workshops where we showed... Uh, people exactly what they could do on their own uh, in the hopes that they wouldn't have to pay somebody to do it for them. But as is so often the case in life, uh, there were lots of people who didn't want to do it themselves. So I had been teaching. In fact, it was my favorite part of the business. Uh, and, uh, and when I sold my part of the firm in 2012, I stopped working for money, promised my wife I would never uh, work for money again, and started a foundation to continue teaching. And I had no idea what was coming because uh, the, the number one item we had on our nonprofit the goals was to underwrite a class at Western Washington University on, on personal investing, not personal finance but personal investing for non-finance majors, because there are a lot of young people who are not taking finance and accounting, et cetera, and need this information to make good decisions as, uh, as they come out of the university. So I'm curious, just from a business perspective, obviously it's a nonprofit, but from a business mind perspective, how are the donations used? Are they used to cover the costs of, I know you have podcasts, videos, newsletters, books, all kinds of materials. Are the donations used to cover the cost of producing that, like video editors and, and any other costs like that? Uh, yes, we don't have it uh, for specific items. It, it just goes into the general fund to underwrite our, our, our total expenses. And uh, our total expenses aren't high. Our donations aren't high. Uh, I, I have had the responsibility of, uh, of making sure that we're okay with making donations ourselves, my wife and myself. But, but, uh, the fact is, is that, uh, our goal is to get our work in the hands of at least a million young people. And, and, and so, uh, I think we're going to get there before we run out of money. Chris, how did how did Paul get you get you on board? What what made you interested in in joining the journey that he's building? Well, Paul was the teacher at the right time for me. I was coming up on retirement, and I was realizing I needed to get a deeper understanding of personal finance so that I could live off my investments and and be more confident that they were invested prudently. And I started listening to a lot of podcasts, reading a lot of books and magazines, and uh, Paul's message just resonated with me because I, I have a technical background and it was, it was data driven. It was evidence-based. Uh, it was grounded in academic research. So I, I reached out to Paul and volunteered. I just said, Hey, Paul, can I help you out? Thinking, you know, maybe that'll get me the chance to learn a little bit more. Cause I always learn better when I'm doing than when I'm just studying. And, uh, you know, I thought it was a long shot, but Paul did what he usually does. He picked up the phone and he called me. <laughs> uh, you know, when people reach out to Paul with a question, a lot of times he likes to just talk. And to my surprise, he had a project. He had an idea of something he wanted to do that I could help him with. And I had an idea of something I wanted to do 
that he was interested in. And so, uh, you know, we started working together uh, and uh, those first two things were Motif investing and the Bastion class ETFs. Motif is long gone now, uh, but but it's uh, it's been really fun working with Paul. He's one of the best bosses. I'll put that in quotes, air quotes, that I've ever had. He's just very appreciative. And uh, Susanna points out I've had other bosses that paid me money. Susanna is my wife. Um, so, you know, Paul doesn't pay me money, but the, the emotional and psychological income is great. What has been the biggest challenges with the nonprofit? Well, uh, the interesting thing is I, I would have thought the maintenance of a nonprofit was going to be uh, a bit of a, of, a, of a hurdle. It turns out there's an organization called Foundation Group. And I looked at what others would, would uh, charge us to set up a nonprofit. And by the way, ours is what they call an operating nonprofit. We're actually working to do something as opposed to simply giving money away. And, and uh, uh, for about $2,000, other people quoting me $20,000, not only did Foundation Group set us up, but for a very minimal fee, they take care of all the tax reporting for us. And, and uh, it, it makes it possible for almost anybody who really wants to, uh, to have a, a nonprofit foundation. And, and uh, now we got to find out what the future of that foundation will be. But it's all in place now to, to continue helping people theoretically forever. Is that fee monthly or annually or just a one-time setup fee? What is that like? It was a, a $2,000 one-time fee to, to I fill out the forms, then they do all the work to get it through the IRS. And uh, they assured me they had never had one that didn't get through the IRS. The IRS is real suspicious of people who claim to be in the financial education business. They, they suspect it may be a way to be finding an uh, access to people pretending to be a nonprofit. So you have to prove that you really are going to be doing something that would be appropriate for a nonprofit. But uh, uh, they got us over all the hurdles and, and we got approved and, and we've been working with them for 10 years. I think they probably, probably cost us $1,500 a year to maintain our legal status and to do the, the, there's a, what's called a 990 PF that you have to, you have to submit to be a, a nonprofit. They do all of that. Th those are the kind of things I, I do not want to do. So that was not a hurdle, but our hurdle is always going to be, how do we reach uh, the young people that we want to help? And by the way, we also help a lot of old people because our our work uh, covers from birth to death and uh and so but it's much easier to get to the old folks um than it is to the young folks because they really don't know about us in a normal way it's uh, when you want to get to old people you can do work for the American Association of Individual Investors which I have for 40 years so there are lots of ways to get to the audience there. But boy, this opportunity to be on this interview with you, Robert, is golden to us because we know we're talking to the young people that our work truly can be a life changer. Yeah, we're going to get into to all of that and, and talk about all the life-changing financial education and, and knowledge you and Chris both have to share. One more question about the nonprofit is, why do you think so many people pay for financial education when there's content that is like yours freely available? And, and maybe it's not even just yours, but there's other people that create free content. We create free content. Like why do people pay for education, financial education specifically when you can just get it for free, like through you guys or any other great source that there is? Well, part of it may be that old uh, saw that, that uh, uh, you get what you pay for. And so if you're getting it free, it either isn't very good or it's only an attempt to find another way to get into your pocket. Uh, and by the way, that is not uncommon. There are a, a lot of people who offer okay free advice, 
But then when the, the, the rubber meets the road, they're recommending things that are terrible uh, for investors. So there's a lot not to trust. Uh, I just did a GPT chat uh, uh, question regarding a particular online advisor. I won't mention uh, the, the, uh, the particular person, but th they got it all wrong. I mean, they claim that this guy is recommending no load funds when, in fact, he's recommending load funds. And so it makes me question, at least in our industry, how good uh, the chat GPT is going to be. Maybe later it'll catch on. But right now, it hasn't figured it out. Hey, Robert, if I can chime in on that. Uh there's a lot of different ways to pay for financial education too. Uh, you can buy a book and I, I think a lot of people would get good bang for their buck out of buying and reading a book about personal finance. Um, it, and I think to Paul's point, a lot of the free information comes from people who charge you for a service. Uh, they, they're charging in some other way. Um, but there are services you can pay for that are just informative as well. Um, and uh, sometimes there's a conflict of interest. Sometimes there's not. Uh, I think the really tricky part for a young investor is figuring out, and Paul talks about this a lot, who to trust. You know, what's the source that you trust? And there is a tremendous amount of good information available for free. There's also bad information for free. And so it's it's kind of up to the investor to navigate that. And unfortunately, it's a it's an area with a lot of a lot of conflict of interest and a lot of bad information that goes along with some good information. And I think it's fair to add that uh, we can offer it free because we're retired. Chris is retired. I'm retired. Daryl's yeah. retired. We have a few people working for us, a handful, but that that we pay. But but basically. Uh, we're a bunch of folks who have simply uh, been through the, the school of hard knocks and have learned a lot. By the way, it's not very difficult. It's not complex. In fact, the, the best information is probably the most simple uh, information. And yeah. that's something else people don't necessarily trust, that could it really be that one little thing you might do would put another million dollars in your pocket. It just doesn't sound right. But I can assure you, if the future looks anything like the past, there are ways that are going to put an extra million dollars into people's pockets. And Chris and I are not going to make a penny on that. But I will tell you, and Chris will, I think, agree, the psychic income we get from what we do is just as good as the money at this point in our lives. So. Uh, we are getting paid, just not with money. And, and we've worked really hard to keep that conflict of interest out of the foundation. It was one of the things that drew me to it and led me to trust in it is that Paul makes no money off of uh, sponsorships or uh, giving favoritism to a particular investing strategy or uh, to you know, favoring a particular fund. Um, we do have an affiliate relationship with M1 Finance, um, which we disclose openly because we think it's an efficient and easy way for somebody to set up a brokerage account. But, but if they want to do a brokerage account at Schwab or Fidelity or wherever their 401k is instead, we're totally fine with that. But keeping that conflict of interest out of the way and making sure that our motives are pure is really important to the foundation. And to your guys' point about who not to trust, on your homepage of your website, it says, we are educators, not financial advisors. Our work is geared toward do-it-yourself investors, but we always recommend seeking qualified and ethical fee-based professionals to discuss your unique life goals, risk tolerance, and the consequences of various investment decisions. The part of this section that on your website that stood out to me was where it talks about a fee-based professional. Explain what the difference is between a fee-based financial advisor and one who is not fee-based and why you believe in one over the other. I'll take it first, Chris, because we both had strong feelings about this, I think. Uh, 
fee-based, first of all, let me talk about what we don't want you to do. We don't want you to invest where there's a conflict of interest, where uh, somebody is getting uh, an immediate commission for having made that purchase, because we would like to believe that whoever that advisor might be, and we are not advisors, and we say it, we're teachers, but that whether it's an advisor or a teacher, what they are suggesting is something that is 100% in your best interest. And there are people who take a commission, which means in, in the normal uh, situation, that commission is going to be because they sold an actively managed mutual fund that recently has had a good track record. That's always a, re a requirement. And, and they are going to pay a price uh, for that in more than one way. Not only are they going to pay a commission, but they are going to get less diversification more than likely. Not only are they going to pay a commission and get less diversification, they're going to pay higher taxes, according to Morningstar, in those actively managed funds than they would in an index fund. Uh, so there's all sorts of reasons why they're require suggesting that you invest in certain things, but they're not in your best interest. That does not mean they won't work out. It doesn't mean you're going to run out of money before you run out of life. That, that, that's not necessarily the outcome of dealing with somebody who has that conflict of interest, but you are not maximizing what you could have gotten without taking any more risk for you <laughs> and your family a family that you know and family you'll never know. And so uh, we want that relationship to be without conflict of interest. And then there's one other group of people out there other than people like us that are doing it for free. And those are people who do it by the hour. And and and, and they will charge virtually, you know, 500 to $1,000 to take a look at your situation and tell you what you should do but then recommend that you be in kinds of investments that are truly for you rather than for the good of somebody else. Uh, and, and, and those are great. And finally, and this is a tough one, because I had, an, I, I had a firm, I was running a firm that managed money for people and got a percentage of the money under management. Now, as I said before, we told them how to do it on their own. And we need to be paid for what we did. And when you manage money that way, you can put the investor in the very best thing that you know and get paid out of that account, as opposed to being rewarded for selling a particular fund uh, to somebody. Now, that's a more complex potential conflict of interest. And so even there, there can be conflicts of interest. But that's generally for people who are never going to do it on their own. They're always going to have somebody else do it. They take a fee, a percentage typically, for that work. And and I think that I think that's fair. What would you add, Chris, out of curiosity? Uh, two things. Part of what we're looking for in that fee-based relationship, as Paul described it, is this lack of conflict of interest. And one indicator of that is that the person you're working for for the fee is acting for you on a fiduciary basis. They're, that, they're, that will help explain that there isn't a conflict of interest. Now, there's a lot of people in the industry who will say that they can act as a fiduciary, but that's different from acting for you in a fiduciary capacity. And so that's an important thing to clarify. Uh, and then the other piece is, I, I think, related to uh, this idea that we're focused on DIY and not everybody wants to do DIY. It takes learning and, uh, and developing at least enough understanding that you can do it for yourself. And there's a lot of people who they're just not interested. They don't want to take the time to learn. I've had so many people come to me and say, just tell me the answer. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do. And, and those are the kind of people who are probably best served by an advisor uh, because they, if you're not going to take the time to learn, 
you're not going to have the conviction to stick with an investing strategy until it benefits you. And you really need somebody to help you stay the course and hold your hand and guide you. And, and that may very well be money well spent for people who don't want to learn and on Robert, their own. if I could add one more thing. We believe that the do-it-yourself investor has a responsibility to learn what an investment advisor needs to know because you have the most important investor in the world as your client, and that is yourself. And what is it that an advisor really knows to do that's so special? It's not an asset allocation or some you know, balance of stocks and bonds. That's not the secret sauce. The real secret sauce for a good advisor is that when the investor wants to jump ship and you sit there and you calmly talk them out of panicking and likely selling at just the wrong time. Now, the problem for the do-it-yourself investor is now they're talking to themselves about this, which means Chris and Daryl and I have to provide them information so that they truly understand how the market works, the volatility you're going to live through, the implications of how much fixed income you have in the portfolio. Truly, they have to know what an advisor understands. And if they're not willing to do that, then we're probably not the best teachers for them. But if they get it, I really believe they can be a, a, a really successful lifetime do-it-yourself investor, which means you never have to pay anybody else. You keep it all in the family. We're going to get into Chris's book next. But before we do, I want to talk to you, Paul, a bit about and ask you to explain the ultimate buy and hold strategy, what it is, what it consists of. And how the idea of what's quote unquote right in investing has changed over the years, as has medical advice around smoking and even protein consumption. Uh, yes, uh, the, the, the ultimate buy and hold strategy. This was a way initially in mid 90s. It was a series of steps that would help me explain the importance of using a whole bunch of different equity asset classes. Big companies, small companies, value companies, growth companies, U.S., international, REITs, emerging markets. There were a bunch of them. And so I wanted to do it in a way that was super, super simple. And there weren't too many moving parts when they looked at this portfolio when they were done. So what we did was we made the assumption that you put all your money in the S&P 500. How would you have done? over a period of time. Then we took step number one. We took 10% of that portfolio and put it into a different asset class. And we looked at, okay, 90% in the S&P 500, 10% in large cap value. What difference did it make? Did it do anything for the return? Did it do anything for the risk? And it turned out the risk went down a little bit or stayed the same, but the return went up a little bit. Not a lot, but up a little bit. And then we showed, okay, pretend you started with $100,000. What did you now have as compared to the S&P 500? And then we did it one baby step after another, adding small cap bland, adding small cap value, adding REITs, adding international different asset classes, adding emerging markets. So you had this portfolio that had 10 different equity asset classes, and it was producing a much higher return. I mean, significantly higher return than just having your money in the S&P 500. And that's how we managed money for people. Obviously, if you tweaked it, you'd want to have more money in one equity asset class than another. But that now suggests you're starting to do market timing and doing things to make the process more complex. So it wasn't the ultimate because we knew how to make more money. But it was a portfolio that you could say, look, you have massive diversification. You are protected against stock risk 
The only thing that you are, are, are not protected against is market risk. But you are protected if by chance the S&P 500 decides to go down for 10 years and other people's don't, other assets don't. And so you had this big advantage of this additional diversification beyond just the number of companies, but among different asset classes. And that's how we managed money. And that's how I started teaching people with our foundation until Chris came along. And then my life changed and John Bogle criticized my work. And then our, our work changed and they were both, John Bogle and, and Chris and all these people were instrumental in figuring out ways that you don't have to own 10 different equity asset classes. So that is perfect because the subtle, the subtitle of Chris's book is a quest for simple and effective investing strategies. And that caught my attention because of the word simple and effective. Because when I read about everything that you just said, Paul, and explained the ultimate buy and hold strategy, the very first thing that I thought to myself was, I don't want to have to do all that work. I don't want to have to buy all these ETFs. I just want simplicity. So Chris, talk to us a bit more about your book and your quest for simplicity. We really wanted to have something that we thought a lot of people could do. <laughs> and so the, the, the quest part of it, uh, in some ways, was me challenging myself to do enough research to be confident that what we were going to recommend would work for people in the future. There's, when, you, when you test looking backwards, there's no guarantee that the future will look like the past. So we tested lots and lots of different periods of time. Uh, hundreds of different scenarios starting as early as 1928. And we did January of 1928, February of 1928, March, all the way through to the end. And we looked for uh, very simple but effective strategies that would help people prudently get a gain on the money that they set aside while taking reasonable risks and you know, hopefully help them set up for a good retirement. M most of us are not going to be able to save enough money to retire on comfortably. Uh, it just it just doesn't work that saving ten percent per year. Let's say you work for forty years, you save ten percent for forty years. You're only going to have four times your annual salary saved. Well, if if it didn't grow, you might be able to live off that for four or five, maybe six years in retirement but most of us are going to be retired a lot longer. And so we were looking for ways with not 10 funds, but just one or two funds to be able to recommend something that we thought would be prudent and would help people grow. And obviously the simplest solution and the one that lots and lots of young people use is a target date fund. Uh, if you invest in a target date fund, the back testing says that your the the median, like uh, half half of the scenarios are better and half of the scenarios are worse. But the median outcome is that you'll have about twice your lifetime spending power if you save 10% for 40 years working and then are retired for 30 years. So that means if you weren't to invest at all in the target date fund, you just have the money that you earned to spend. That's it. But on an inflation-adjusted basis, if you set 10% aside into the target date fund, and that's all you do. By the time you retire with 4% withdrawals, and then by the time you die, between what you spend in retirement and what you die with and what you spent while you were alive, it's, it's worth double what you would have had had you not saved. So that's, that's a huge win. And that is a simple and effective strategy. It's an amazingly simple and effective strategy. You outlined also in your book the different levels of elegant simplicity. You had symbiosis, intermediates, and complexity for different fund combinations. Take us through those different levels. Well, obviously, you know, one fund is about as simple as it can get. So it's a target date fund. You just pick the year you're going to retire and you find the fund that's got a name that's pretty close to that. That's as simple as it can get. But we think most investors could probably handle a little bit more complexity. And in fact, we know that people who invest in target date funds 
often also invest in a second fund or a third fund. They they do almost, uh, they can't help themselves. <laughs> they have a little complexity. So then the question comes up, well, if you're going to add a little complexity, what would be the best complexity to add? You know, would it be adding more target date funds of different dates? I have friends that do that because they're uncertain about when they're going to retire. The net effect is that you just average the dates together and that's what you've got. You still really only have the glide path of one target date fund. So that does nothing. Uh, so the question was, what could you add that would make a meaningful difference? And from the work that Paul had previously done, I, you know, I was led to the academic work of Nobel Prize winners, uh, uh, Fama and French, who basically have studied how different parts of the stock market perform over time. And what they say is that, uh, or what the research shows is that the small and value part of the market goes up and down at slightly different times. It behaves a little differently than the large part of the market, which dominates what's inside a target date fund or the S&P 500 or, or a total market fund. And it has a little bit higher return historically, the small and value parts of the market. And so when you combine these two things, the small and value parts with the, the total market, which is kind of the equity piece inside a target date fund, you end up with a higher return per unit of risk. You get a, an improve, improvement in the performance with only a slight decrease uh, or increase in the risk. And that seems like a, a good gain. And in fact, if you just take Let's say you're doing that 10% saving rate in the target date fund. That means you're saving 10 pennies out of every dollar into a target date fund, and you're spending the other nine on taxes and living and everything else you got going on. Well, if you take one of those 10 pennies you're saving towards retirement and you put it into small cap value, the difference over a lifetime is millions of dollars. It's, it's a huge bump in what you will have to spend and pass on to heirs. If you take two of those pennies and put it in small cap value, it's even more. And in the book, I, I talk about uh, how you can do that with just two funds, US small cap value and the target date fund. Or since you mentioned it, you know, the slightly more complex uh, chapter talks about, well, what if I still want international diversi diversification you can split that small cap value in US small cap value and international small cap value. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. To break out of the treadmill of slaving away each week only to have nothing left over, Watching the savings you have get eroded away by inflation's vicious bite or freeing yourself from the corporate grind. It all requires you to master the conversion of time into value. To help you do this, we created a list of four simple steps to taking control of your personal finances and life. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. And, and then there's all kinds of questions that come up about other ways to do it. And that's why I wrote a book. <laughs> it, it just, I, I knew that along the way, as somebody invested in this strategy, there would be a lot of questions. And I wanted to prove to myself and also give readers the answers when they needed them, uh, these, these other questions. You briefly touched on this, but I want to dive a little bit deeper. What are the pros, cons, and maybe shortcomings of backtesting and all the backtesting research that you've done? Well, the biggest pro is that the future might not look like the past. Uh, and, or I mean, the biggest con is that the future might not look like the past because uh, your, everybody's history, everybody's life experience is going to be different. But you could say that about a lot of things. Um, the weather, right? The future weather might be, the future climate might be different from the past, but my best indicator of what is likely to happen when I walk out the door is still what I know about last year's weather or about you know, the forecast. And so I rely on it and I, I adjust my clothing accordingly. <laughs> and so it's not, it's a very imperfect science. 
so what we looked for when we look at these back tests is not, you know, a one-off occurrence that said small cap value helped, but we look at every 20 year period since 1928. And what we see is that 99 plus percent of the time, small cap value was a performance enhancer. It helped. And so the odds of small cap value being helpful to somebody moving forward, then we conclude is, is pretty good. And the other thing we look at looking back is how often did it hurt? And it very rarely hurt somebody. So it's an imperfect science, uh, but we, we try to look for things that have overwhelming evidence that they're likely going to be helpful. And because it's an imperfect science, it, it tells you you probably shouldn't go, go back and you know, be too extreme in the conclusions you, that you draw. So uh, we would not recommend that somebody put all of their money only in small cap value for their entire lifetime, even though history says that has the highest return, not just because we think that it may be different in the future, but because you could wait through five years or 10 years or 15 years of, of underperformance before that premium or advantage came to pass. And if you were to give up on it partway through and trade while it's down, so to speak, you then, then you have no chance of getting the benefit. So it's really important that you pick a strategy that is, I'll call it moderate, moderate enough that you can stick with it. And that's one of the reasons I love the idea of putting 10% or 20% in small cap value and not even rebalancing it. Because, you know, if it's 10% and it's a little underperforming, A, you probably won't notice. And B, um, it, it's not a huge part of your portfolio. So I think people are likely to stick with it and stay the course. Where if you put all of your money in it and then you find out five years in that the S&P 500 has been outperforming, you're far more likely to second guess your strategy and switch. Paul, in your book, We're Talking Millions, you wrote, the reality of having a million dollars 40 years from now might fall short of your fantasies. And you also wrote that 40 years of actual inflation from 1980. 80 to 2020 reduced the purchasing power of $1,000 to slightly less than 300. How should young investors be thinking about inflation and its impact on their retirement? Well, I think they should be building it certainly into their plans uh, as, as a cost of, of living, just as they would uh, health care and taxes and other things they'll have to deal with. Uh, when I came into the industry in 1966, uh, I used to, to talk to a lot of young people. And uh, if you ask them, what is your financial dream? How much money would you be happy with if, uh, just, if you just have that as your goal? And what was the answer? A million dollars. A million dollars. And again, I mean, it was always a million dollars. And, and, and I still teach. I teach university classes. And I'll ask young people today, uh, how much would you like to have? What's that number? It's a still a million dollars. Now, a few engineers in the class will say five or six million, but but most people still think a million dollars is a really big deal. And of course, in order to replicate that million dollars that looks so good in 1966, you probably do need six million dollars today. So they need to understand that the cost of living is likely uh, to be a lot higher in the future from everything we know about the past. And they need to understand that the expected life uh, that they're going to live is going to be longer. And, uh, we have a brand new granddaughter just born last November. According to actuaries, uh, studies, uh, she will has a 50% chance of living until she's 103. And in Japan, the number is 107. So not only do we have to worry about inflation being part of our life, we may have to worry about it being a, a longer term that it's going to be impacting our financial needs. So uh, I think it's imperative that you, that you understand that is a, a cost. And so many young people are not willing to put money in the stock market because it's so risky and it's gambling and it's speculative and it, 
you, know, you might as well go to the horse races and put money in the stock market. Well, none of that is true over the long term. But what we do know over the long term is bonds have made about 5%, the safe investment, and stocks have made about 10 I also know the worst 40-year period for the S&P 500 since 1928 was an 8.9% compound rate of return. If we look at the bonds, the worst 40-year period is a gain of 1.6% a year. So those people who are hiding in bonds because they're afraid of the risk of the stock market just don't get it. And that's because they haven't looked at it carefully enough to see that the risk is in the bonds, not in the stocks, when we look at the long term. And so between living longer, inflation, higher taxes, by the way, when I came into the industry, Robert, the, the, the marginal tax bracket was about 70%. That was the highest they would take from you. Now it's much lower than that. But you know something? 50 years from now, it could be right back up at 70%. So they have to also understand that that's a possibility. So uh, I want them to oversave. I want them to have more money than they think they needed, not because I'm greedy or they should be greedy, but because things don't always work out like we think they will. And unfortunately, one of the factors that most of us are really not prepared for is bad luck. And in the market, there are periods of good luck, like 1975 to 1999, a 17-plus percent compound rate of return. But put the money into the same investment in 2000, and since then, it's only been a 7% return, 10% less per year. And that's the bad luck, and the other was a good luck. And fortunately, I grew up during the good luck period, and that helped a lot. You mentioned that bonds are the risk compared to stocks when you're looking at returns. I think there's also the risk of people my age not just not investing. You know, uh, they're, everything you said, Paul, is so, so true that I've heard. You know, not to say that you gentlemen are old, but I'm a little bit younger than you guys. And uh, I hear it every day from my friends, my family, like, I, I grew up in a very blue collar family. I think I'm the first one in my family to like ever make any type of real stock investment or a, any type of real investment. So when I, the conversations I have with them are very, I want to just say representative of like general population America of like non-investors. And that's a lot of my friends growing up are the same way. And everything you said in terms of like, they all say, oh, it's gambling. I'll just go to the, I'll go and, and go to the casino or, you know, I'm just throwing money away. Like those are all, legitimate real things that I hear almost every day, every conversation I have with people that are not educated on on financial topics, whether it's stock investing, personal finance, budgeting, et cetera. It's it's so, so true. Well, and and Warren Buffett has a great quote. Um, I'll be 80 in October, so I'm trying to come up with my favorite 80 quotes for uh, October. But But one of them is Warren Buffett's quote. He says, don't say what's left over after spending. But spend what's left over after saving. Just pay yourself first. And it doesn't have to be a lot. And the, the, the idea that, well, I can't possibly afford that because I, I, I have so many expenses and things. Well, if that's the case, take a second job. Now, I know that sounds, that sounds very aggressive. But I have known a lot of young people that in order to fund their retirement, they took a second job, not a lot of time, but enough to be able to fund that. And that commitment means delaying gratification. And we know for a fact, and I'm the first to admit that I'm guilty, delaying gratification at the dinner table for me is really difficult. I have been overweight since I was a kid, and I'm still overweight because, you know, it's there, it's fun, I love it. And, and, and you just have to be able to have the discipline. The beauty of investing is that you can put it away and just forget about it. You don't have to watch it. That's not true of eating. Every day I have to face three to four meals and start all over again. But with investing, no. You can just do it once a month and, 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 and ignore it. 
some people, Paul, say that you we have a limited amount of decision making capabilities or ability to delay gratification, et cetera. So you just used all of your your uh, all of that that in your investing, and so now <laughs> in the food side of things, you might not have as much uh, as much left to give. <laughs> now you both. Chris is very analytical, Paul, but you both are are pretty principled in your investment approaches. So I'm curious to hear how you, this is probably one of the questions I was most excited to ask you both is, is how you think about the debate between investing versus paying down debt. Should they be done together at the same time? Should they be done one before the other? Should they, like, how do you guys think about that? Go ahead, Chris. Well, it, you know, we lived through a very different history than the one that young people are living through today, although it's a little more similar now than I wish it was. When we bought our house, it was, I think it was a 10.5% uh, annual percentage rate on the loan. And so it seemed prudent to us to try and pay it down. And our uh, our mental models about personal finance were very unsophisticated. We just thought to ourselves, we have four children. Uh, we want to help them with college because our parents helped. Well, my parents helped me with college and I thought, thought uh, you know, I'm supposed to pay this forward. That's going to be incredibly expensive. If we have our house paid for by the time the kids are in college, <laughs> then it'll work out. We'll have, we'll have that cash flow to help for them. I, uh, I know coming up on retirement, we were also really stressed about cash flow. You know, just trying to figure out like what's it like to live off your investments? You know, will they maintain their value? Will we be watching them decline in value? Uh, as my wife said when we retired, she's like, where's the money going to come from? Right. I mean, that's kind of, you've had this paycheck for all of those years. So when I think about paying down a loan, um, the thing that comes to mind first for me are the psychological factors of having debt. I, I think that, that a purely analytical perspective or, you know, or from a pur purely analytical perspective, if you have a one or 2% loan, you know, a two would not be unheard of in recent years, two to 3%, you'll probably get a better return in other places, but that doesn't mean that there aren't psychological advantages to or cash flow advantages within your life that may make it interesting to pay it down sooner. So it's it's a balance, it's a very personal thing. I I think for many young people, if they have a low interest loan, I would encourage them to get going on the retirement savings while just paying down the loan at whatever the minimum required rate is. I provided that fits with their comfort levels and their other life plans and things. Uh, I, I do think that uh, there are a couple of things that I, I would like to see young people do. First of all, uh, the choice between a regular 401k and an IRA uh, and a Roth 401k and a Roth IRA, uh, there are lots of reasons why you might pick the traditional over the Roth but I really encourage young people to take advantage of the Roth now only because we have no idea what tax rates are going to be 40 or 50 years from now. And it is a way of protecting against the risk of higher taxes later. So that, that is one fork in the road that, uh, that may not be the same as other advisors would recommend. Uh, as far as this decision between debt and putting money away for retirement, when you see how big that first five years of IRA investments are uh, compared to the rest of your portfolio, uh, and by the way, it may even be that you would say, okay, this is my first five years. I'm going to be all equities. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to, with this five years, I'm going to be all equities for the rest of my life. The rest of my portfolio is going to be a traditional, more balanced portfolio. But this is for the long term. And boy, does it have a long term to work. And if you miss those five years, you miss an absolutely golden opportunity 
uh, to maybe early retirement, having way more in retirement, or leaving more. I mean, those are the potential outcomes of that. Now, if that means extending the payment of the debt period, I would be okay with that. Now, when it gets to be you got debt that costs 12 or 13 or 14 percent, uh, that's a that's a hard one to suggest that they that they that they do the 401k or the IRA first. But with when there's a, a match out there, there's no question you should jump on that match. I I don't think you ever let a match go by because that's free money. And even if you end up spending more interest in the long run, you will have caused a discipline to happen that when you look back at it, you'll say, you know something, the extra two years I had to pay on that debt is nothing compared to what I got in my pocket right now. The problem is we can't get young people to look at life 50 years from now. Uh, and I don't think that, that we probably did either. Uh, but boy, we see it now. and so. That would be my approach. There's a balance between when it makes sense to go ahead and invest and, and, and pay the debt later. I don't mean make your regular payments. I'm not suggesting you stop making payments. But as far as paying it off, it's okay to wait. If you're doing something powerful with that money and getting it to work in a, in a, in a tax-free environment at a young age, that's, that's golden. You're muted, Robert. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, yeah, I think that powerful piece is important because if you have money to pay down debt and you don't invest, the, the question is invest versus pay down debt, not pay down debt or spend that money frivolously, right? Like if you're going to either pay down debt or go spend that money on a new computer, new bag or computer or car or whatever that that's different than the the question between debt and investing so i think your point is is right there at the end is really important paul but i asked this question i was excited to hear you guys answer because this is something i'm really struggling with myself right now and if listeners of the show go back even a year ago two years ago with this podcast and you listen to my philosophy on debt back then i was i was okay with debt i was okay with if you had if you had some like consumer debt, maybe a car loan or or any other type of debt that was really low rate, two, three, four, five percent, but you had some extra cash flow, my philosophy back then was I would rather buy a rental property with that, generate cash flow from that, take the cash flow from the rental property to cover the debt. And now you're getting the asset, you're still covering your, you know, et cetera. So that was my philosophy for had been, but the and, and I was so against Dave Ramsey. I like I couldn't stand him. He just made me cringe. And now the last, I don't know, six months or so, I've kind of, I don't know, Dave Ramsey has been kind of getting in my brain a little bit. And I'm actually like coming around a little bit to what he's saying. And I like, I kind of understand and I'm kind of going that way. And, and, and Chris, to your point, some of it's, it's psychological. My, I had a truck loan. It was relatively small. It was like 10,000 bucks. So it wasn't like a big deal, but it was 2%. And so I was like, okay, I could do a lot better things with this money. But just knowing that that truck loan was there, it just bugged me. And you know, I just, it wasn't too big of a deal. So I just focused on paying it down. But I looked at like the interest calcs. It tells you like, okay, if you pay a little bit extra, like I was only going to save like total, like 250 bucks in interest. So like, I really wasn't saving much in interest and it just mathematically wasn't probably the right decision, but it just bugged me having the car loan there or the truck loan, I should say. And so I just got rid of it. But now I have a little bit bigger debate because I have my student loans that I'm trying to decide, do I want to pay those out a little bit faster? That's a little bit bigger balance, but I'm thinking like, okay, let's say it's like 50,000. So that's a little bit bigger than 10. And now I have to say, okay, well, if I put 50,000 into my investments now, like how much is that going to be in the future versus if I pay down my, my student loans. And so I have Dave Ramsey on one shoulder. I have, you know, the investment thesis kind of on the other shoulder. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. What? Well, well, <laughs> yeah, personal. There's a reason that there's a reason that personal finance is called personal. It it's yeah. very it's very individual. It's not all analytical. It's got a lot of emotional components to it. I you know I, we went through times in my life where I was out of work 
and not having obligated payments or having smaller obligated payments in those period of time helped a lot. So it's it's really uh, hard to know exactly what's going to come your way and when you're going to appreciate not having those payments. Well, and uh, the other yeah, the other tough. part, the reality of making the choice to invest is about one out of four years, the market goes down. And so you can decide to invest and not pay off the truck. And the next thing you find out a year later, the money you put in is down 40% or 30%. And, and, and it, because, because there's no risk in the past, we always know what we should have done. It, it, it really bothers us. We get upset with ourselves. I can remember as an investment advisor sitting with couples and and they had just gone through a year when the market was down. And one of the couple would say, we could have gone on a trip to Europe with that money. And, and, and so that isn't the way you should think about it, but it is the way people think about it very often. And it doesn't make for great investors, if that's how you look at it, because uh, you're in a business. When you invest in the stock market, it's a passive business, but you are in a business that goes up and down like businesses go up and down. I started a business, my investment advisory firm back in 1983. It took 30 years of ups and downs before it matured and became what I was able to use to pay for my retirement. But if every time it was down, I would try to get out and go to work for Boeing or something. But, you know, it, it would not have worked. And that is the hard part is helping people, particularly young people who are inexperienced, get into that state of mind that says, look, this is not something I'm worried about day to day, year to year. It is something I'm worried about for 40 years. And even though the, the foundation may not be as, as big as it could be because I could have invested and the market went up, but it went down. The fact is you got some money working in the portfolio. And in the early years, it is your money that is most important. This is one of the interesting points that, that, that Chris brings up in his book, the, the importance of that early money. It's not about the stock market. It's about you building the foundation. And, and, you, and you have to understand that it, it might not quickly work out well, but that's part of the process. One of the hardest truths about personal investing is that it's too easy to learn the wrong lessons. You can step into the market, you can see it go down, you can conclude that, oh, this is not for me, this is never going to take me to a good spot. You can get out and stay out the rest of your life. And it's just too easy because of the randomness to learn the wrong lessons. And that's where we're really trying hard as educators to help people understand that even though there might be short-term volatility in the long run, these are prudent risks and, that and are going to help you out. Add something that I, I think is really important. We have a on our website a thing that says boot camp. Boot camp is a series of eight articles, eight podcasts, and eight videos about eight of the biggest decisions that you will ever make. And one of those decisions is to understand the implications of adding bonds to your portfolio to, 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 to modify the volatility in the bad times. But we don't just say get ready for uh, losing some money along the way. We show you in every situation, whether you're 100% bonds or 10 or 20 or 30 or 40% bonds, what was the worst month? What was the worst a year. What was the worst three years, the worst five years? This is what you have to expect to go through to make it to the end of, of, of this trip. And, and that is hard. And it's the reason, and I think this is important, that so many of our followers are engineers or other people who are numbers-driven people by their nature. And people who don't like numbers will probably find our work to be a little bit frustrating. I can't give myself much credit as an investor, but the one thing I can give myself credit for is 
I tend to have a really good stomach when it comes to this stuff. Like I, I don't really go in and out like friends of mine during COVID and that crash, they were always like, what are you doing? And I'm like, honestly, I haven't logged into my brokerage account in like, I don't know, two years, <laughs> two years. Like I can go years without ever logging in. It's all automated. I haven't looked at it. I haven't done anything. Like I've literally gone years at a time yes. without even logging into my brokerage account and, and thinking about it. So that is, that is the one thing I can kind of give myself a little bit of credit, credit for, but I have one last question for you both before we wrap up today. And that is, is there a, a place in people's portfolio for play money? Is there a small percentage of a portfolio that people can, can go pick stocks, trade options, play with pennies, do whatever they want, really? Is there a 1% of their portfolio, 5%, 10%? Is there a, an allocation you guys think that's reasonable to be able to go play around and, and make kind of risky, non-long-term investments? Go ahead, Chris. It, you know, I think uh, play with what you want to lose. Uh, that would be my starting point. Just assume that if you're if you're playing, you might lose it all. Now, having said that, there's some fun history in my family. My grandmother and grandfather bought some uranium rights in Utah, and then sold it. it it kind of went crazy and they did well by it. It was a small investment and uh, they ended up buying houses for their kids out of the gain. So, you know, sometimes these things play out, but I can tell you it didn't change their investing strategy for the rest of their lives. They, that was the only time they ever invested in uranium. It would, and in fact, if anything, they got more cautious as they got older and they invested less and less in that kind of play money stuff because that uranium stuff that they sold at a profit eventually went to zero. They just happened to get lucky, right? And they could, they could recognize it for what it was. It was luck. And so I, I think that if you're going to play with something, make it the money you're happy to lose. And I personally, I don't play with anything more than actually, I don't, I don't have anything in my portfolio. I would call play money. Uh, but uh, yeah, if I did, it would probably be 1% or less. Cause I don't want to lose. I, I don't have any money in my portfolio that I would call play money. I would say that in a way, in 1983, when I started uh, the investment advisory firm, uh, I said that I was not starting the firm to have it grow, be a big firm. I was, I was looking to do something that I thought would be fun. And, uh, and so I committed to being willing to lose $15,000. And that was it. And uh, that's all I ever invested in it. Of course, I put a lot of sweat equity into it over the years, but as far as actual investing and taking a risk, but in a sense, it was like for me, because I don't have any hobbies, uh, what I'm doing right now, this is my hobby. I don't play golf. And so I was investing in a sense in my hobby, uh, and I don't see how that's any different than spending money on golf. Uh, but I do say to people who want to speculate, all I care for you is that you don't speculate with money that you might need later in life. And the problem with that is we have no idea what we're going to need later in life. My wife and I have a dear friend who's, I think she's 68, and she, and she requires around-the-clock the help. And I think her cost of living is something like, I mean, cost of being taken care of is, is $24,000 a month. And, and, and she had accumulated a lot of wealth, thinking she was going to leave it to her daughter. And in our last conversation, she says, I'm not going to leave anything to my daughter because it's likely to take what I've got to get through where I am. So how do we know this stuff? And of course, at that point, you could say, well, would that $5,000 have made really made any difference? So there's there's probably it's all back to what Chris said about when it's about personal investing, they're all personal decisions. And behind almost every one of those decisions is a kind of a dream, either a short-term dream or long-term dream, because 
it's about the unknown. It can't be anything more than a dream in a sense. And and but but I really don't encourage people to speculate with a lot of money. You're muted again, Robert. I got to get better at that. Well, thank you guys both so much for joining me. You both were very generous with your time. I know you're retired, but I still time is still very valuable. And I appreciate you taking out over an hour of your time out of your day today to chat with me and the audience and help us get better with our finances. So thank you both for joining me. Where can the audience go? Where would you like them to go to connect with you both? Well, we are both available at paulmerriman.com. And our dream in life is that every one of your listeners will get the free two funds for life and the free, we're talking millions. And the reason we provide it as a free PDF is because you can then send it to all of your relatives you think might find it helpful. We really are on a quest to help as many people as we can. And that is the greatest help that, that people can be in helping others get our stuff. So thank you, Rob, for this opportunity. And, and Paul said earlier that, uh, you know, the ultimate buy and hold wasn't the ultimate in the sense that it's the ultimate for everyone, but we really want people, if they're going to be buy and hold investors to find their ultimate their ultimate portfolio, whether that's a target date fund, a two fund for life strategy, any of the other portfolios we have on our website. It really is about finding the one that is right for you that you can stick with because that's what lets you, Robert, look away, right? You've decided, hey, I'm good. I got it. I, you know, I mean, this is good for me. And uh, the six words in investing that I love to quote from Jack Bogle were buy right, hold tight, don't peek. And to do that, you have to find your ultimate buy and hold. You have to find your portfolio. And that's really what we're trying to help. I will put a link to you guys' resources, the website, everything in the show notes below for anybody that's interested. And to what Paul alluded to is that if you go to their website, there's a, a book section. If you click on the books, the titles, it actually opens a PDF with the books for free, like the entire books all in PDF. It's no email capture, no nothing. It's free. It literally just opens right up. So it's it's pretty neat. I, I was telling Paul and Chris before the interview that I was surprised that it worked that way, but it's it's pretty great. So if you guys want those free books, go to the website, check it out. I'll put links in the show notes below for everything that we talked about today, the website, and all their resources. And again, Chris, Paul, thank you guys thank so you. much for, for joining me Paul, today. I think it's helpful just to start with what an investor's goals are and what their tolerances or other considerations are. Are you trying to achieve higher returns than the market? Are you comfortable underperforming the market by 8% in one year if it means having higher expected returns than the market? I think these are the kind of considerations investors need to have.